Welcome to GRE. I'm your host, Keith Weinold. How do you buy a giant apartment building of, say, $5 million or more? That is daunting to most people. Where would you get the money for that? How do you get the experience? And what are the benefits of buying a giant apartment building at all? And more today on Get Rich Education. The annual Spartan Summit is on. I was the kickoff speaker at the last event. This year, they are back in person, and the keynote speaker is none other than Shark Tank's Damon John. Learn from industry experts on real estate, tax strategy, lending, and entrepreneurship. You'll also get to tour tangible turnkey income property in growing Alabama markets. It's coming February 16th to 18th in Birmingham, Alabama. Get your ticket or learn more at SpartanInvest.com today. You can get a 50-year-old house somewhere or buy a new one directly from the builder with tenant resilient amenities already built in. With over 3,000 Florida units at different construction stages, they are exclusively for investors. President Wagner and Alaska and team also invest strongly in their own product. That's belief. Start at buildtorentdirect.com. That's build the number two rentdirect.com or text 407-927-5074. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Hey, welcome to GRE. I am your affable host, and my name is Keith Weinhold. You probably know that by now. You're listening to one of the longest running and most listened to shows on real estate investing. That is our major, so to speak, with miners in the economics of real estate and that all important wealth mindset. Heard in 188 world nations, we are all about expanding your means rather than living below your means. I always wonder about listeners in some of the more far-flung places, though. Those nations not so proximous to North America. What about those 20 listeners in Uzbekistan? Are you creating arbitrage over there? Moldova, all nine of you. How's your leverage ratio? And you haven't quit your daydream, have you? Um, Much like last week, I guess I'm in a quirky mood again. I don't know. Two weeks in a row might be a coincidence, but three in a row could be a personality trait. I guess we'll have to see what happens next week. As for today, yeah, it's about raising money from others to buy a giant apartment building. Where do you get the money and where do you get the experience? Now, if you ever talk to a big commercial lender of apartment buildings, those people see lots of deals come across their desk. They'll tell you that virtually every big deal of, say, 100 apartment units or more is not bought by an individual. It is bought by a group. So you sure don't have to do it yourself. And this group has a syndicator, sort of a leader. That person could be you someday. And that syndicator is known as a general partner. They're the ones raising the money. And all of their investors that have funded that deal, those people are known as the limited partners. And there are some strict rules laid out by the SEC, that is the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, when you are placing other people's money into a deal like this. Our guest today and I are going to get into that and some terms like a capital stack. Do you know what a capital stack is? That refers to the layers of capital that go into a big real estate deal. So a capital stack example might be that you funded a giant apartment building with a 30% down payment raised from investors, a 60% first mortgage, and a 10% second mortgage. Right there it is. So your capital stack consisted of those three layers in that case. Now, our guest and I agree on more than we disagree on, but you might notice in the interview that one thing that we see differently is that I believe it takes a whole new set of skills from owning a duplex up to owning a 200-unit apartment building, and maybe he even agrees with me there. Some real differences between those two things, though. In a duplex, you're not going to have something like a specific on-site property manager, unless it's you living there. And with a 200-unit building, yeah, you are going to have a designated on-site property manager that's there during each day, most likely. Now, with a duplex, you're not going to have to manage 
Yelp reviews from your residents or a Facebook group for the property. And with a 200 unit building, well, maybe you do. Think about how the advertising would be different for when you have a vacancy once in a while in the duplex or how that would look with a 200 unit apartment building where in that building, you might constantly have at least one vacancy. You got to think about how that would change your advertising targeting and so on. Well, it's doable to own a 200 unit building, of course, because there are 200 unit apartment buildings out there operating all over the place. But the point is you would probably hire certain team members to do those certain specialty things in a giant apartment building. And these are the reasons why owning a 200 unit apartment building is really more like operating a business with employees sometimes than a duplex is. Now, it might be worth it, and that's what we're discussing today. It's just a different set of skills. Before we discuss those things with our guests, I've got a few things that I want to share with you. I recently traveled through a few cash-flowing American metro markets, and when it comes to the property tours that I did in various cities, you know, I'm pretty encouraged by how good-looking some of these new-build turnkey properties are, granite countertops, and plank flooring are really quite standard anymore. Well, that's been that way for a while. Now, as far as something that's changed, yeah, you know, it is important for me once in a while to go inside these properties and see just what is being offered in turnkey marketplaces. Because think about how supply chain disruptions make it difficult for builders to finish houses, whether they're building new or whether they're renovating a property. See, a home just isn't that livable if something like the door hardware hasn't arrived on site, even though that's a rather small thing, or the kitchen is still waiting for the cabinets to be hung, or the refrigerator hasn't arrived. So for the builder and for the tenant, really, sometimes the property is frustratingly close to being all done. Well, going inside properties, and again, overall, they look really good, but sometimes when I do something like open up and close a kitchen cabinet door. They just feel really light in my hand. And sometimes it makes me wonder if the builders are getting the grade of the materials that they want sometimes due to these supply chain disruptions. So my point here is get the third party inspection before you buy your income property like you always should anyway. But see, upon hiring your inspector, eh, just kind of ask that inspector to Make some careful notes on any items that have had supply chain issues lately. You don't want your builder or your turnkey rehabber compromising on the quality of the materials for a property that you're buying. And again, overall, what I'm seeing in the marketplace when I actually go inside turnkey homes today is that they do look quite good. But you can understand the builder temptation to just get something done when they're, say, 98% of the way to making the home resident ready. You just don't want them quickly filling that last 2% of the home's components with shoddy material. So get that inspection before you close. Hey, one really positive trend in the real estate world is when last week it was reported that Freddie Mac wants multifamily landlords to report positive rents to credit bureaus in order to give renters a better shot at qualifying for a mortgage. Yeah, now I think this is good news. I don't think of it in the way that I'm going to lose my tenant sooner. I think that the more likely effect that this can have is that your tenant is going to be highly motivated to make on-time monthly rent payments to you. Yeah, they'll have motivation to make rent payments to you in a timely way if they think that it's going to affect their future ability to buy a home. And now this is a lot like when Fannie Mae made a recent move to include rental payments in its mortgage loan underwriting process. So this is some good news. And Freddie Mac said that currently only 10% of renters benefit from on-time rental payments as part of their credit score. So getting that 10% number higher, that is good for you as a landlord. And it's just good for society, helping ensure timely payments. Let me tell you about a live special in-person event coming up. It is the 2022 Spartan Summit. It is February 16th to 18th in Birmingham, Alabama. I was the kickoff speaker myself at the last Spartan Summit. For this one, the keynote speaker is Shark Tank's Damon John. 
And although I feel pretty comfortable in my real estate knowledge, I think that with Damon headlining at this time, you're going to learn more about how to bring entrepreneurial lessons to real estate investing. Damon, some of the lessons that he learned were most notably launching the hip hop apparel brand called FUBU in New York City in the 1990s. So consider coming out to attend the Spartan Summit. See, Alabama has turnkey markets that you would probably like to visit anyway, like Huntsville and Birmingham, where the event is based. And plus, you might snag a front row seat for Shark Tank's Damon John, and a ticket for all that is just a few hundred bucks. Yeah, you're going to learn from Damon and other industry experts on real estate and tax strategy, lending, entrepreneurship. And you're also going to get to do a tour. Yeah, the provider will give you a tour of tangible turnkey income property in growing Alabama markets. It's coming February 16th to 18th at the Forum Theater in Birmingham, Alabama. Grab your ticket at SpartanInvest.com. You can do that right now. Yes, you had me speaking at the last Spartan Summit. The next one is headlined by Damon John from Shark Tank. And that is only about three months away. And what do you think? You think that Damon is going to look at your deal and then he's going to say, I'm out? Huh? What do you think about that? Is that the risk that you take if you sit up front this time? (laughs) I think that you're going to be glad that you went to this one again, February 16th to 18th in Birmingham, Alabama. Get started at SpartanInvest.com. And if that isn't enough stimulation for you, then let's talk about how to buy giant apartment buildings. This week's guest is an entrepreneur through and through, and he's a passionate person about helping others become financially free with real estate investing. In fact, he is the author of the Amazon bestseller, Financial Freedom with Real Estate Investing, and the podcast of the same name. He's helped investors purchase over 9,500 units valued at $445 million through his training programs. He's approaching a half billion there. So he's more than just a pretty face. He is clearly a guy that's beyond buying his first Memphis turnkey single family rental or something like that. In fact, he is the CEO of Nighthawk Equity. They control over $200 million in multifamily real estate. So he controls that much himself. It's been a few years since you were last here with us. Welcome back to GRE, Michael Blanc. Keith, great to be here. Michael, in my opinion, you're such an expert in the apartment building investing space, and you're really great with answering that dire question so many people have. And that question is, how in the heck would a person of average income and average means ever get the money to buy and take down a huge apartment building? But before we get into that, let's drop back and start closer to the beginning. You were an everyday employee, then an entrepreneur, and then you lost everything by investing in a pizza franchise. And after that, you tried nearly everything in real estate until you did then succeed and become financially free. There's a lot there, but tell us about that journey. I call myself the crash test dummy of financial freedom because <laughs> when I read that idiotic purple book in 2004, uh, that was- you know, it really threw me for a loop. It was pretty smart. And I was like, man, I don't have any passive income at all. If I stop working right now, I stop earning money. And that boggled my mind. I'd never even heard of the entire idea. At the time, when I read Rich Edport, I had a bunch of money in my bank account, actually, with my broker, because I had a software IPO. Not because I found it, but I was a super early member. And it went public in March of 2000. It was a company called Web Methods. At the time, the most successful software IPO on the planet. It was really exciting. I had to travel with Learjet to Wall Street on the day of opening we all felt like geniuses. We're a bunch of young guys, you know. You look in the park. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was fantastic. Then I read this dumb book and I was like, man, I got to get me some of that passive income. Of course, the book doesn't tell you how to get it. It just puts plants a seed in your brain and you're left with the task of figuring out, well, how am I going to do this? Well, after three months, I came home one day to my wife and said, hey, wife, I quit my job today. She's like, what? Oh, yay. Said, yeah. Don't worry. We have plenty of money in the bank. I have a long runway. I'm going to become an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> She wasn't too pleased about that. So what I did, I just did everything. I hired a mentor. I flipped a couple houses. I learned, I traded stocks and options for like a year and a half. But my big idea was restaurants. I was surrounded by restaurateurs, actually investors in restaurants. They're like, yeah, it costs this much to open. You hire a guy to run them all and you sit back and count the passive income. I'm like, sweet. I mean, where would you would sign the Donna line, right? Sounds Come good. On. What could possibly go wrong? Of course, no one saw the recession coming uh, several years later. And that changed everything. I subsequently lost my IPO millions in the recession. It took me 
probably five years to unwind that thing, I suppose somewhat gracefully. However, in the process, I lost everything. I tacked a couple of hundred thousand dollars on debt. I was able to get in the, in the heyday, almost lost my house. And then while this is going on, I'm like, man, I flipped a couple houses back in 2005. I'm just going to dig myself out with real estate. So I'm thinking real estate, real estate is the answer, right? We're all thinking real estate is the answer because Kiyosaki mentions real estate. He doesn't mention restaurants. What an idiot I am. Real estate, right? Obviously. Okay. Well, I'm not going to wholesale real estate. That's for beginners. I'm going to flip them and then maybe I'll hold a couple. So I started flipping and raising money, you know, six month term, 12% simple interest. And we were flipping like two houses a month. It was kind of cool business while I'm getting out of the restaurant. So I'm losing restaurants like crazy in the restaurants. I'm making money on the house flip and I'm working like 80 hours a week, basically making no money at all. It was awful. (laughs) So one day, uh, one of my wholesalers brought me this 12 unit in Washington, DC. And I had taken a seminar, I forgot to mention in 2006, this, uh, this apartment building seminar. And I worked at for about nine months. So this guy brings me this whole 12 unit building. And that was my first syndication. And raising money for a syndication is considerably different than borrowing money from private individuals to flip houses. I didn't think it was a lot different, but it's significantly different. So that deal in itself was a nightmare. And after I got that settled in, I was like, I'm slaving, trying to get out of these restaurants. I'm flipping these houses. And meanwhile, this apartment building is sending me mailbox money. I'm like, I am an idiot. I need to do more of that and less of this. And that's when I saw the light and I started pivoting and I started blogging for myself. I was blogging to bigger pockets and I put out this analyzer, which is probably the one of the most widely used analysis tools on the planet now, which is cool. Then I was like, well, why don't you teach me what you know about apartment buildings and raising money? So I created a course. And while this is going on now, now I'm blogging, people are bringing me deals. They're bringing me money and led to the point where we are now, where we own over $200 million in real estate. But our mission really is financial freedom with real estate. If you read that purple book and you're like, hmm, I'm going to flip a house, maybe. Maybe I'd like to have a conversation like we're having now. (laughs) Yeah, well, there's so much there in that little purple book you mentioned. Of course, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it is great at changing one's mindset. But yes, it kind of leaves you longing for more and wanting to make it actionable. But that book is so powerful that it does make you want to take some action and apply some tactics. So we talk about the tactics in real estate investing. We talked about some that failed for you and then some that succeeded. You were even getting some relatively early experience with raising money for a 12-unit building. So tell us about the niche that you congregated to within real estate because it is such a huge world from wholesaling to flipping to buy and hold to mobile home parks to apartments. So tell us more about your niche and why you chose what you did, Michael. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I kind of think I am where I am right now because I've just experimented with different things. I've done almost everything and I've never had a strip club before. I guess I should start that. <laughs> but you know, I've done software, I've flipped houses, I've done restaurants, lease options, all these different things. And some of them just simply failed. But some had a fundamental flaw, like, for example, flipping houses are very active, not very passive. And so apartment buildings appear to solve that problem. And I didn't know it at the time, but it didn't just work for me. It works for a lot, a lot of other people. And what's interesting is you can use single family house as a stepping stone like you have. And you house hacked and you've done small multis and you kind of graduated to larger ones. I think that's totally fine. What, What we've been finding over the last few years is that you can even skip that if you want. You can still go in there, but you can even skip it. People who do that, regardless of their experience or how much money they have, they're literally able to quit their jobs in like one to two years. It's staggering. And it's very difficult to do this with single family houses. You'd have to do many years in a large portfolio and a lot of work to get the same place. So the reason I am right now is because I saw it working for me. And then I've seen it work for hundreds of other people. And I interview a lot of them who quit their job. And I say, well, how did you quit your job? And it's always very similar. A lot of people start with single family houses and they kind of cut their teeth a little bit. And then once they shift to multifamily, literally within a year, they've quit their job. And people are doing it more and more without the single family. So that's really, really inspiring to me. And that's what kind of gets me up in the morning. Part of finding what resonates with you within real estate is a process of elimination and learning about what doesn't work. So before I ask you more about getting financial freedom in a short period of time and how you come up with the money, I know that you did lose several thousand dollars in one of your first real estate investments. Oftentimes we can get a lesson from others' mistakes. So if you don't mind opening up, tell us about that. Interestingly, I've lost some money in real estate, not much. I've never lost any money for investors. There's maybe one house or two house flips that I lost some money. But the really, the massive loss was on restaurants. It was never really on, on real estate. The only reason I lost on real estate on those flips is because I did not get the after repair value right. And that was because it didn't comp cleanly. 
and then sometimes a budget we would go over budget on on some of the construction so you're not going to win every single house flip but we won probably 95 percent of them that's pretty good yeah for early flippers getting the estimate on that after repair value right is often quite the challenge for some a lot of people when they think about real estate investing they think about they either need to be a hands-on flipper or that they need to be a landlord themselves well i've never been a flipper and i haven't been a landlord in years i only was in the early years so we kind of have this context of how we think of a stereotypical real estate investor and then there's the real world so i guess what it's coming down to is who do you think Think that real estate investing is for? Do you think it's broad enough that it can be for absolutely anybody? Yeah, I do. I interviewed Gino Wickman, who wrote Traction, a uh, system for scaling companies, but his, his latest passion is the entrepreneurial leap. And he postulates that entrepreneurs are born, not made. And I had a fun with Gino because I slightly disagreed with him. And what we agreed on is actually the bar to, for entrepreneurship in real estate is substantially lower than any other business you can possibly imagine. This is true. What's unique about multifamily specifically, I didn't understand this until later, is in a single family world, it's you, right? It's me, myself, and I. In multifamily, it's almost always a team sport. It's typically joint ventures. Now, there's four roles, two primary roles, two to four in a syndication. One is the person who finds the deals. Then there's a role for getting the capital. Then there's someone who runs everything once you do some deals. And then eventually, when you get big enough, you got to worry about marketing. So the deal finding and capital raising is two different personalities in many different cases. The deal finding route is are people who are good with numbers, they're detail oriented, they're very organized, but maybe they're a little more introverted, right? So the idea of going out and networking with strangers, not so great. Then there's the capital raising people and they have the gift of gab. They maybe love to play golf and the sight of a spreadsheet makes them break out in a cold sweat, right? Well, both of those roles are required in multifamily syndications, but the beauty of it is if you're an introvert, you love numbers, you do that thing. And if you love people, you can build relationships with capital raisers. And now you're doing something you're good at and something that you love. And those two together can scale their business rapidly. And this is one other major difference, Keith, is these syndications is not just a side gig. It almost always starts on the side, but people who get into this recognize that they are literally starting a multi-million dollar business because once you do a deal, you're not going to do the same size deal again. You're going to do a larger deal. And after that second deal, that third deal is even going to be bigger still and so on and so forth. And once you do a deal, you put a professional manager in place. It doesn't take any more time to simply add to your portfolio. We're running $200 million in revenue with five people. That's amazing. Yeah, so we're talking about the value of your team in real estate investing. We talk about how if you start a real estate business, I think it really is one of the easier businesses to start in a sense. There's sort of like a template that's already laid out for you that you can follow versus having to be as innovative as, for example, coming up with a new invention or a completely new system or something else. So there is somewhat of a template to follow. Do you think that operating apartment buildings is more like owning and operating a business than one to four unit properties are? Are there more business-like considerations there once you get into those five plus unit apartment buildings? What are your thoughts? In my mind, a duplex is just as much of a multifamily as a 50 unit. From a commercial lending perspective, there's obviously a difference in how you get a loan. But in a mindset thing, it's exactly the same if the person buying the duplex has decided they want to go the multifamily route. Now, if you're a single family landlord and you get into duplex or a quad, your mindset is still single family house portfolio. That's different. But someone who says, oh my gosh, I love this multifamily thing. I got to get myself a multifamily, but I can't wrap my head around it. The only thing I can possibly see myself doing is buying a duplex. Okay, that counts. Then buy that duplex, right? Do whatever you can because a lot of people who are financial free today start with a duplex, including the president of our investment company, Drew Niffen. He started with a triplex. So many people started with small, multi you started as well. While I might judge you and go, ha, 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 look at a small deal you're doing, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. What matters is that you get started, whether it's a two unit, four unit, 15 unit or larger. In my mind, you are on a journey to multifamily, therefore to financial freedom. We talk about making the jump into larger apartment buildings. And I bring up, is it more like managing a business? Michael, I'm thinking about things like you having someone on your team now, for example, manage Yelp reviews or manage a Facebook group for a larger apartment building community, which is just the sort of thing that you wouldn't have to be concerned about with a duplex. Are there other business considerations like that that someone that's operated in the one to four space just wouldn't quite have a grasp of yet? 
that's all a matter of scale because the things you describe aren't even relevant when you do your first deal, second deal, or third deal. Honestly, we didn't start doing that until we had like a thousand units. We're like, man, we're going to buy this deal. We're going to put the best property manager in place and we're just going to do the best we can. Like those are like super advanced things that you're talking about that are important when you have a large portfolio, tiny, tiny tweaks make a huge difference. If I can do something where I can save $15 across 2000 units, that's a lot of savings indeed. But in the beginning, those things are not important at all. What's really the most important is doing your first deal. That is absolutely the number one priority is getting that first deal done. There's this this interesting law that I write about in my book called the law of the first deal. It's literally universal. I have yet to find a single exception to this rule, but it goes something like this. If you do your first multifamily deal of any size, including a duplex, you're literally one to three years away to quitting your job. It is just so simple. Therefore, all of our resources are focused on helping people do that first deal because when you do that, that second deal happens essentially automatically. You don't have to expend any energy to do that at all. It just kind of follows. You start becoming a lead magnet and a money magnet. And then that third comes also automatically. And most people are able to cover the living expenses because the deals get progressively larger. So if you start with a duplex, the second one is not going to be duplex. It'll be a 10 unit. And the third one is going to be a 20 or 25 unit and so on and so forth. The biggest thing to remember from this stuff, if you want to go the multifamily route, is focus like a laser, the one thing on doing that first deal of any size. Oh, I agree with you on so many levels there, Michael. Just get started, whether it is a single family home or a duplex or a tenplex, because not only is that where the real learning comes in, you also might be leveraged at four to one or five to one. It can't be counted on, but over time with leverage appreciation, oftentimes that's where your capital formation can come from. So let's talk about that capital formation, because a lot of times an investor, Michael, they think about it coming from within their portfolio. But if you really want to get a big sum of money to go take down a huge apartment building, often it does not come from your own funds. So we're going to talk about that right after the break. How does the average investor, the average person with an everyday income go big with a larger apartment building? If you're listening to Get Rich Education. Our guest is Michael Blanc. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. You know, a lot of investors choose either cash flow or home price appreciation, but one real estate market could provide both, Jacksonville, Florida. They've got 27% lower home prices and higher rents than the national median. Their market has appreciated 34% more than other comparable cash flow markets over the last 30 years. Get positive cash flow today and above average appreciation for tomorrow. They often have available inventory in Jacksonville, if you can believe that. Start at cashflowandgrowth.com. The people that our listeners can't stop talking about are Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. They've provided GRE listeners with more loans than anyone, and it's where I got my last few loans. They finance single family income property up to four plexes. They're the number one lender for beginners and veterans. Start your pre qualification, chat with President Chaley Ridge personally, and get your custom plan for expanding your cash flowing portfolio. Start at RidgeLendingGroup.com. Hey, is your IRA in a real estate syndication? Yikes, a 37% UBIT tax could hit you, but you still have a chance to set up your EQRP and avoid this. Did you make too much money in 2020 and need more deductions? Now federal law lets you set up an EQRP in 2021 and get deductions for last year, yeah, retroactively. Even put old IRA and 401k money in Bitcoin, gold, or your own business. Get control of all of your retirement money, tax and penalty free, Text EQRP in all capital letters to 72000. This is Ridge Lending Group's president, Shaley Ridge. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. And remember, don't quit your daydream. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. We're talking with Michael Blanc. He's the author of the book, Financial Freedom from Real Estate Investing. He's also really an expert in apartment building investing, especially with helping newcomers get into the space and answer some of those compelling questions that can really be kind of daunting to people when they consider taking down a larger apartment building. And that central question, I think, Michael, is, so how do you get the money to invest in a huge apartment building? How do you guide people? Yeah, I get this question all the time, Keith. It's like, how do I get the money for this stuff? And I've heard about this apartment building thing 
it's pretty cool, but I don't have the experience and I don't have the money for it. I'll start investing in single family houses for a few years and then I'll take that experience and the money I make and I will graduate to apartments. Now, it's not a bad plan, but it's unnecessary. In other words, you can get started with apartment buildings right away. Though one major stumbling block for people, of course, is the question you ask, how in the world do I get the money? Some of you listening to this probably maybe have money to buy a duplex or 10 unit or whatever, and that's great. And you should certainly use your own money, but eventually you're going to run out of money. Therefore, the only way to really scale is by raising it. And that's the secret. That's the, when the light bulb went off for me with that 12 unit that I could raise money from people without having to beg them or ask them to or compel them or manipulate them to invest. I found that people who normally have money have different problems, problems nonetheless, right? Their biggest problem is the volatility in the stock market. They can't make reliable predictions in financial planning. The stock market doesn't produce cash flow, so they can't quit their law practice or their medical practice, their high court paying job. They can't quit their job. And number three, every time their broker sells something, they got to pay capital gains taxes. They're like, man, this is something is not right. And you as a real estate can help them with all three of those problems. So it's just a matter of educating people around you, sharing your enthusiasm. And what really happens is you simply start educating people. When you stop asking people for money and instead provide value to them by educating them about alternatives to the stock market, they start leaning in. And now they're like, well, do you have an opportunity? Well, I said, not right now, but I'm working on it right now. Why don't we talk about it a little bit more? And so this is how you raise money. You really raise money by sharing your enthusiasm with people and by educating them. And then you start with your sphere of influence, the people you already know. You get referrals from them. You can do some networking. And therefore, you continue to expand your network as you go on. So that's really the art and science of raising capital. Genuinely, it can come from a place of giving for that person that's interested in raising capital down the road. If one shows enthusiasm for real estate investing around their coworkers, if your coworkers notice that yeah, you seem to have more income from them because you've got passive income coming in and you're taking a trip to Hawaii again. In fact, that's a lot of things that my employees asked me back when I was in the working world. That made them want to know, now, how exactly are you doing this? And I think it just sort of happens organically and it comes from a place of giving and, and helpfulness. That's right. And that's the shift. I had a, a Camilla just on the podcast and she just quit her job three days ago with apartment buildings. She said her first capital raise she was pretty confident she could raise a half a million dollars. She ended up raising just $50,000, a big loss, right? And she said the biggest mistake she made was that she asked people for money and she appeared needy. The second time around, she completely shifted and she went into teaching mode and she raised the $500,000. Now today, she's raised much more than that, but it's really about providing value to valuable people. I've learned that a very disarming question for people is when you talk to them about an investment that you're in and you're interested in attracting their capital, really not asking for the capital, but kind of transitioning in by asking a simple question like, now, if I ever went out and found another deal like this, is that something that you would be interested in? That's one of those transitional things without asking for the money, but getting that person thinking about the fact that they could invest through you and like you. That's exactly right. Uh, now you're implying that you had a deal that you can present to people because you said the last deal. What if you don't have a last deal, right? Because you've never done one before. Well, that's okay. There's a solution. We call it the sample deal package. Basically, you create an investor package from a deal that you don't own. It looks like a real investor package, but you don't own the deal. The point is, it's a conversation piece. You can say, hey, we're looking for deals that are substantially like this, X units, this Y in return. Ask me your biggest, hairiest questions. And you do that all up front, long before you actually have a deal on a contract. Therefore, you get verbal commitments from investors who have already asked you the big, hairy questions. Why multifamily? What are the risks? Why should I invest it with you? And then you get a verbal commitment from people. Oh, yes, you know, if you find a deal that's like this, I'm actually very interested in investing $50,000 with you. That's great. Now, when you have a live deal and you already have five people that are committed to investing with you, well, now... You could literally, now, how much confidence would you have in making an offer and say a million dollar building when you got five people behind you? Very high degree of confidence versus going in there and being on a million dollar property and you got no investors behind you. I mean, you're not going to be very confident. So that's really the art of raising capital without any kind of experience. 
That's great. This sample deal package, concrete deals that you're not really offering, but they might be real deals that were done somewhere else to help with that transition and help build this de facto experience, if you will, and get into the mindset of understanding what prospective investors' questions are. And when you can serve them and give good answers to their questions, pretty soon you can turn them into real life investors. That's exactly right. That's how you do it. Yeah, that is a great way in order to get experience. Now, a lot of times when someone thinks about the money to try to make things more concrete, oftentimes when it comes to multifamily apartment buildings, again, five plus unit buildings up to perhaps several hundred units, typically it takes 25% down payment. So can you tell us what a capital stack is and talk to us more about that? Therefore, the structure of the deal, if you're syndicating and attracting money from investors... Yeah. I mean, so if you're flipping houses, you know, you're maybe using hard money, your own money, right? So it's hundred percent cash, right? Fast cash. If you're landlording, you're going to get a loan on that and you're going to put 20% down, 25% down. So you get residential loans on those things. And in the commercial world, five units and higher, it's very similar, right? There's a down payment and there's a loan. The difference with some of the larger properties, unlike residential, is that those loans are not personally guaranteed, which is super cool because with residential, Number one, there's a limit to how many you can get. And number two, you normally personally guarantee it. So if a house were to go in a foreclosure, it's you. They're going to come after you. With commercial real estate in general, you can get what's called non-recourse loans versus if something were to happen and it were to go in a foreclosure default, the bank just takes the building back and the general partners basically are not at risk personally, unless fraud is committed, of course. That's a different thing. So it's quite a bit different. So when you raise capital, you're getting loans that are you know, 80% loan to value. Interest rates are unbelievably low. Even today, they're non-recourse. It's amazing. And you have to raise the equity for the down payment, of course, but you're also raising equity for closing costs. Uh, you're raising equity for any kind of construction, though you can actually borrow part of the construction as well. And most importantly, you can raise the equity so you get paid an acquisition fee at closing, which is the most exciting part because acquisition fees are substantial. They tend to be around 2 to 3% of the purchase price. So imagine you buying a, a million dollar building, which is small, and you get a $30,000 check at closing, right? Imagine that with a times five, $5 million deal. That's a $150,000 acquisition fee. And this is really the, the reason why so many people can quit their job even after their first deal. It doesn't always take three deals at all. They quit after their first deal because they get this acquisition fee and it extends their runway and they see a pipeline forming. They're like, my gosh, if I quit my job right now, I do this full time, I can scale even faster. So it's the difference between recourse and non-recourse loans. There's a carrot for you in the acquisition fee when that funded deal closes. And of course, there's ongoing income in the deal for the syndicator that puts the deal together as long as they perform at a certain level. So tell us more about that performance level and the preferred return that a syndicator can achieve. There's different kinds of returns. So we talked about the acquisition fee for the general partners. The general partners also get paid asset management fees while they're operating it. They get equity in a deal for putting a deal together. It's called sweat equity or carried interest. It's very lucrative for general partners to put these deals together. It's also very lucrative for the limited partners. These are the passive investors. They're called limited partners because the law protects them from general liability, such as lawsuits, for example. The general partners have general liability. So if there's something that were to happen, the general partners have to deal with it. Limited partners are limited only to how much money they invested. In return, however, they don't get to be operators and decision makers. That's the general partners. It's very lucrative for limited partners because typically multifamily or other asset classes like mobile home parks and self-storage, typically a lot of operators are looking for a 15% average annual return for their passive investors. That's staggering. I mean, the average uh, annual return in the stock market, depending on what time frame you choose, is substantially lower, especially over a 20-year period. So 15% compounded, literally compounded every year is amazing. And more importantly, typically we target 8 to 10% cash on cash return, meaning that every year you invest $100,000, you can expect to get eight to $10,000 checks every single year. And that is very lucrative. For someone who is a high earning job, much, much better alternative than the stock market. So for you, the listener that's been out there building up your portfolio with one to four unit properties, maybe you're satisfied with that and you always will be. Maybe you're wondering what's next because at one to four unit properties, if you're a married couple, you could in theory get 
up to 80 units at the best rates and terms. That's plenty for some. That's limiting for others. And some just want to bypass that altogether. This is really a way for you to become bigger, faster. And Michael helps people on both ends. If they, if you are potentially interested in becoming a syndicator yourself and learning how to raise money for bigger deals, that's if you're on the active side. And he also helps investors on the passive side. If you want to invest passively in someone else's syndication, there are Securities and Exchange Commission regulations and all that that Michael Schur will tell you about. But Michael really does a great job of laying out these sort of stepping stones for you can learn what's next if you do indeed want to go bigger, faster with apartment buildings. Again, on either the active side and learning what it takes to raise money and be a syndicator yourself, or on the passive side, being a passive investor in someone else's syndication and knowing what to look for. And Michael's put some great resources for you at getricheducation.com slash apartments. Tell us about those resources, Michael. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, there's, there's different ways you can get involved in multifamily, either as an active entrepreneur, someone who wants to buy and syndicate these deals. And then for passive investors, we have a special page for you. And on that page, we have a, a report that's called, What's the Better Investment, Stocks or Real Estate? And we compare the two, the pros and cons, and also answer a lot of common questions around multifamily syndications in general. So regardless of who you are, if you want to be active or you want to be passive, and, and sometimes you want to be a bit of both, check out those resources and they're at getricheducation forward slash apartments. What's better, real estate or stocks? I already know the answer to that, so they don't even have to read that, but you sure can over there. I'm making a bit of a joke here. Yeah, learn more at getricheducation.com slash apartments. Michael Blanc is a real guy that's been doing this in the real world for a considerable amount of time. Well, Michael, it's been really fun talking about some of these things that don't come up very often on the show, like recourse versus non-recourse loans and a capital stack and some things like that. Is there any last things that you want to share with our listeners? Yeah, the most important thing, as you said, is get started with something. And I don't really care what it is. You know, do a rental house hack like you did, invest in turnkeys or some of the alternative stuff that you talk about your podcast. At the end of the day, how you do it isn't important. What is most important is that you do it, either on the active side or the passive side. And if you're curious about multifamily, then check us out. Uh, we have some great resources and uh, we'd love to connect with you if you decide that's right for you. Michael Blanc, I have long enjoyed your knowledge and enthusiasm for the space. Thanks so much for coming back onto the show. Oh yeah, big thanks to Michael Blanc. He is one smart guy. He is a good teacher and he is worth following. Yeah, this was a real expand your means show here today. When you're talking about taking down giant apartment buildings, that right there is rather antithetical to living below your means. Polar opposites, two pretty incompatible notions there. Next week, I am talking about a profitable, different way to invest in real estate that gives you stable 6 to 12% cash on cash returns and is really hands off, even more hands off than turnkey real estate investing is. You've been listening to GRE Podcast Episode 370. I think you know that I host and produce this show like I have for 370 consecutive weeks. How about everyone else propping up my slack jawed operation here? And not just propping it up, but if you can believe, tolerating it too? Some that have been with us since near show inception more than seven years ago. For operations, Andrea Newburn, sound engineer, Bidner Jampo, content manager, Matthew Blunt, website designer, Nikon Roy, I'm Keith Weinhold. Though you might quit your day job, don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.